Hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of Being the Space, the podcast where we learn about pivoting and adapting to life. We hear from people of all walks of life, all professions who are going to share their stories and where they started, how they pivoted, things that happen externally or internally in life that have us make some changes and also reach for our goals and live the life that we want to live. So I have a really great guest today. I'm super excited um, to introduce to you a person who I have become acquainted to who's in my field of patient advocacy. Um, this is Deidre Kindred. She owns uh, Your Healthcare Nurse Advocates out of Texas. Um, you can find her on LinkedIn and she's going to be sharing all the places that you can reach her for services. And she's going to talk a little bit about her process. Um, we're both nurses. So, you know, we have that sisterhood and, and her transition from bedside to leaving bedside, which can be a very difficult decision to then opening her own company, becoming an entrepreneur, um, you know, a businesswoman and, and really becoming a very successful businesswoman in the space of patient advocacy. Um, Deidre is really a leader among us and, and has a lot of respect from from all of us who are advocates. And uh, I'm gonna let Deidre introduce herself. Welcome, Deidre. Hi, Adrian. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited. Thank you so much. Well, my Welcome. name is Deidre Kindred. And as she said before, and I've been a nurse for 25 years and it's been a lot of pivots in my journey. So <laughs> we just go from there. Right, it's, yeah, I think nurses really, you know, we wear a lot of hats and many of us have had many different jobs or career trajectories and where we mm -hmm. thought we were going to, you know, start and what may have been, you know, something we were interested in in nursing school or that motivated us to be a nurse shifts and changes over time. And the industry yeah. has changed so much also, which has had yeah. us change. I mean, I, I think the statistics now are something like only 15% of hospital bedside nurses are planning on staying through the end of the year. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, these are startling numbers. And, and then it also raises the question of, well, what, what are we doing? Right. How are people going to make money? How, what are people doing? People, I know a lot of nurses go into real estate, you know, they go into business for themselves. They open companies. Yeah. They, yeah. they may go into teaching. Um, you know, they, they may, open a, start a goat farm. I don't know. You know, so we, this is what we're here to talk about is that you're not ever stuck or trapped in a profession or a geographic location or a mindset, right? It's all about yeah. how, what possibilities we see for ourselves and also the relationships we cultivate along the way and who we find as mentors. And also mm -hmm. sometimes the mentoring we do to others comes back and also pays us with other yeah. opportunities. Um, so talk, tell us a little bit about your story and um, from, you know, nurse student, nurse Deidre to, to how oh, we got yeah. here today. And, and, you know, what were there other things, other professions that you considered or that pulled you that, that you, you know, decided to, to be a nurse instead? Oh, what a great question. So first of all, when I graduated high school, I did not want to be a nurse. Never thought about being a nurse, never considered being a nurse. I wanted to have a large office in a tall building and being able to tell people what to do working in accounting. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I thought I wanted to do. So accounting, school. accounting was the, the draw, right? Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. I want to get my CPA in accounting. And um, so like every, a lot of people, I went to college and I got in there and I was like, hmm. No offense against people who do accounting. My sister is a financial advisor, so no offense, but it was boring for me. <laughs> I, that boring. was my first thought. You know, as nurses, um, people usually don't say nurses are boring. They say a no. lot of other adjectives about us, but we yeah. kind of like to be in motion. And yeah. often in the office environment is not yeah. for us. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it's it was the numbers and the spreadsheets and all that was not for me. So like many people who go to college, you think you want to do something. And so I had to pivot. And the reason that I pivoted was for me, it was God. It was, it's an amazing event that went on. So number one, when I decided to change my majors, I had become a single mom. 
Well, now it's time to get serious. So another pivot, stop all the partying. You have a son to raise. So I was, I had a job going to school for kinesiology. I thought I wanted to be a physical therapist. Mm -hmm. Another pivot, right? So I'm going to physical therapy, uh, getting ready to go to physical therapy school. And I, you had to volunteer in rehab centers just to make sure, you know, it was for you and get some referrals from other therapists. So right. good way to do it. So anyway, I was volunteering at a physical therapy clinic and one of the patients said to me, Deidre, you would make a good nurse. Your hands are so gentle. And I said, I'm not going to be no stinking nurse. <laughs> I, you know, young, 23, you think you know everything, you know, right, all right. these old people telling me, you know, that was the mindset right, at that right. time. Six months later, just to bring forward. Somebody else said, would you explain the discharge instructions to this patient as going home with physical therapy exercises? Okay, went in and explained, and that different patient said, you would make a great nurse because you, you know how to explain things the way I can understand. I am not going to be no stinking nurse. I would people quit saying that, I'm going to be a physical therapist. Right, right. So third and final call. And this is the way I say it's God, because I was sitting at home. I remember it so vividly. I was writing a paper, and I don't know what the paper was about. It was about 7 or 8 o'clock at night. I get a phone call, and the gentleman says, this is Governor Jackson from Texas Woman's University, and we were looking at your transcript, and we were wondering if you would consider changing your major from kinesiology to nursing. We'll give you a full-fledged scholarship if you have a 750-word essay in my office in the morning on what education means to you. What? Wow. And that's this is a, why I wow. say this is God. Yeah. Divine intervention, divine, divine intervention. intervention, who, whatever power you believe in, you know, that's fine. But for me, it's that's the power that I believe in. So I wrote that essay and I got the Mary I. Gorley scholarship to go to nursing school. I graduated nursing school. I want to say it was magna cum laude. And then I, um, went in and chose what hospital that I wanted to be in. So basically I, when we were going to nursing school, I don't know how old of a nurse you are, Adrian, but I graduated in 2007. Okay. I was so, late. I was a late bloomer. I, I can't do it. Okay. It was probably still going on, but the hospitals were so in desperate need that they were recruiting us. They would come to um, our events and things like that. Did we pause? It's a little a little frozen here, but I think it's a little slow. Let's see. You want me to keep going? Let's see. It'll. I think we'll keep up. It'll catch up. Let me see. Let me recycle. I'm going to re... Okay. For some reason... Oh, let me stop sharing and see if that helps. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, am I hmm. slow or is it just you? You're frozen and the timer's frozen. That's oh, why I okay. was asking. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Because my timer, see, that's the thing. It, it'll record locally on my end and then it'll keep, there's kind of the online part and then it's recording locally, but you're a little uh, slow on yours. So that's okay. We're going to edit. I'm going to edit this out. Let me reload it. I'm going to reload the page. So if it pops no you out, problem. just come back in with the same link. No problem. Let me see. Okay. Yeah. See, so it's still like the timer's still going. So I'll just pull all this out. But I think you're okay. okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I have some other windows open. And uh -huh. I'm going to close like all of my windows because yeah. I don't, I haven't quite figured this out. I'm going to get on with tech. Support. That's okay. Uh, it's technology, right? Um, yeah. Th there's, but I've been hearing people having this issue and I'm like wondering, we can't, it's something about, some upgrade they did okay all right okay. so we'll just i'm going to just mark down that to check eight through 
nine, eight through 10. We'll just say eight through 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. So uh, just start back up from where you got in. You started nursing school, you got accepted, you graduated, and you were talking about the context of nursing school at that time. Yes. Yes. So at that time when um, we were senior twos, I guess they still call them senior twos, uh -huh. um, the hospitals were such in desperate need of nurses, which they are now, but they probably need to start this back up again. <laughs> they would come and buy the whole class lunch and try to woo us basically, oh, come to this hospital. We have a sign on bonus. Come to this hospital. We have a great training program. Oh, wow. Yada, yada, yada. Right. So, so they were kind of doing, was it like a job fair or was it just? It was like, yeah. And then they would have all the hospitals come like Baylor, Texas Health, Medical Cities, whoever. Yeah. And they would have their booths there. And then they would, you know, be in competition of who was the best place to work for, mm -hmm. who had the best sign on bonuses, who had the best internship programs. So I ended up choosing a hospital that provided a critical care internship program. Oh, gotcha. So, at the time, I was, you know how in nursing school, they say, oh, go work on med surge. Right. Start med you know. surge. I think for yeah. us, they, our preceptors, see, we had a lot of critical care nurses in the beginning, right. which was great. Mm -hmm. So we basically yeah. learned like from a trauma level one ICU nurse in our Absolutely. first semester. And mm -hmm. I can't even tell you how much more I knew coming out of nursing school. <laughs> And they basically told us, don't start anything lower than telemetry. Which right. is where so I came we out. were we were in on the cusp of because I graduated in two thousand and one. We were kind of in on the cusp where it was kind of changing, was pivoting. You know, right. everything in life pivots. Change is inevitable, right? Mm -hmm. So at that time, I already worked as a CNA on a med surge floor, so I knew I wasn't going to go to a med surge floor and work as a nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely not. I wanted to be challenged. I wanted to be. Um, able to learn and, and push myself. So I went through a critical care internship program and I started on a PCU, which is, I guess, yeah. a step above a telemetry yeah. uh, where we titrated drips and everything on the PCU, which is a progressive care unit. And then um, I transitioned to CVICU really early in my nursing career. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, so after working in CVICU, um, I was eventually training nurses on balloon pumps, CRT, open heart surgeries, things wow. like that, um, on the hospital education committee, on the hospital hypothermia committee. I love being involved if I'm challenged. If I'm not challenged, then I'm leaving. Right. Yeah. A board nurse is not a good thing. You know, it's just like we're, <laughs> I tell people, I said, you know, when we're bored, it's like, uh, it's, yeah. it's just, we ready to self implode. <laughs> right, right, right. And oh, goodness, there's so many topics we could talk about. But I ended up um, also getting my certification as a legal nurse consultant. So okay. I've always had like a side hustle. I taught CPR for fun. I was a travel agent. So I've had other businesses that, in my opinion, were kind of like a side hustle type mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. um, and then I even, and later on in my career, I have gravitated towards seniors. I love the stories. I love the wisdom. I love the knowledge that they possess. You can always learn something from them. And mm -hmm. I wanted to open up a residential care home. So that was another business that I did. Oh, wow. And how far um, into your career did you that? Do was that? about the residential care home was about, I mean, I won't say 15, 20, somewhere in that range, 15, 20 year mark. Okay. So you were yeah. well into your career. Your, your son yeah. is, you know, about raised. Yeah, a, yes. Yes. And uh, yes, he's a grown man now with kids and doing great. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I mean, because, you know, yeah. also, I mean, being a female dominated, you know, field, a lot mm -hmm. of people, you know, how a lot of nurses have kids, they have young kids. You, you're driven to, you know, yeah work, make the money, work the night, either night schedules, do the side hustles, all these things. So mm -hmm. you can take care of your family because most times nurses are, even if they're in a relationship, they're often the primary um, provider. Right? And then you know? let's not even touch the fact that nurses 
you give up so much for your career. Yes. So that's a whole nother ball podcast. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it <laughs> certainly <laughs> is. It certainly <laughs> is. Yeah. I think yeah. I was telling somebody that I was on workers comp, like injury mm -hmm. leave, probably two and a half years, uh, you know, in my career. Um, mm -hmm. you, you give up a lot and, and, yeah. and you gain a lot, weekends. you gain a lot too. Yes. Yes. So it just depends on where you want to go, but I've always had a spark in me to do something different, to do something bigger. Even when I worked in the hospital, I felt like there's something more I should be doing for people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because my, in my opinion, is that the hospitals, when you're working in the hospital, you really don't have time to provide that guidance that people need, that instruction, that education, that um, support. Right, right. There's because always, it, there's yeah. definitely, and I, and I know even when I started, I mean, when I started nursing, it was really when things were really starting to change as far mm -hmm. as California, at least, you know, we were losing CNAs, mm -hmm. we were losing um, secretaries, assistants, all of that was getting cut. And, you know, you're just crunched for time. You yes. need, you know, you yes. see what the patients deserve and yes. especially case management, discharge planning, th what are they discharging back to? What's the environment? You know, all these things, right. Are being discharged too quickly. Um, yep. You know, the kind of the churn of a hospital that, you know, and especially when you're in critical care, you know, oh, you, yes. you know, I mean, um, your highest, I mean, for, you know, folks that aren't in nursing or aren't in healthcare, what, what Dieter does did was, you know, it's basically the highest level of nursing in the hospital setting. I mean, the next step up is being a trauma flight nurse yes. or something like that. Right. And I, mean, I thought about that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but it's been a wonderful, but you know, I want to tell, I call them baby nurses sometimes because mm -hmm. you're never stuck unless you want to be stuck. It's yes. always something you can do to enhance your career path. Yes, absolutely. Don't wait on the hospital to say, Hey, Deidre, Hey, Adrian, why don't you do this? You have to be in charge. So I sought out certifications and learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And what brought me to fast forward to this, I had been in nursing probably about 20 years at the time. And that's when I wanted to open up the residential care home and learned a whole lot about networking, building relationships, getting connections and things like that. But I also learned a whole lot about entrepreneurship. Right. I love entrepreneurship. <laughs> and how, now did you, let me ask you, because I want to get a little context in your family structure. Was there anybody else who was already an entrepreneur or a role model for you? I would say my mother, uh, she was a single parent raising four children. Um, and she wow. always had a side hustle. She always had a, a career, but mm -hmm. she always had a side hustle. So she could build furniture. She could design interior of the home. She was amazing. <laughs> wow, um, wow. She always had something going on. It was never a dull moment where she was like, Okay, I don't know what I'm gonna do. She she sold wedding dresses and and oh my gosh, so she did wow. so many things. Um, so she was my inspiration because seeing a single mom with four kids move from Michigan to Texas. Wow, gotcha. And and what was the move? Uh was that just a professional move, family move? It was a uh desperate need to move because we came from a little small town. There was really no opportunity there. In, in Michigan, you're saying? Yes. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. So uh, opportunity, the doors of opportunity opened up when we came to Texas because it's it's just so much that you can, whew, so many things that you can advance yourself. So she was my inspiration. But another reason I'm going to go back to, I had the nurse, I had the residential care home, ended up failing forward. Mm -hmm. Lots of things. And so, so many people are scared to do something because they're scared to fail. Right. Oh, yeah. 
Don't be yeah. afraid to fail. I Don't like to say to fail. we fail our way to success. Absolutely. Absolutely, Adrian. So if I hadn't done that uh, residential care home, I wouldn't have known how to network. I wouldn't know how to build relationships. I wouldn't know known a lot about entrepreneurship and, right. and having that courage to step out. And actually, you learn more from your failures than you do your successes. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yes. So ended up kind of, I became an independent legal shield associate where I was helping people get access to a law firm uh, gotcha. for contract documents, things like that. And um, how did I, I was networking um, and then I thought about when I was, I was at the same time, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. But I, at the same time, I was building the residential care home. I was also doing legal nurse consulting. Gotcha. Where I read uh, medical records to see if it was a case or not for attorneys. And then working for attorneys was an eye-opening experience because I always felt like it needs to be doing some. We need to be doing something more for the people who are going through things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That they are confused. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what's next. They have no idea. They just kind of water hose with a bunch of information and expected good outcomes. That's not how it works. And I thought to myself at that time, this was like 2016-ish. What right. if there was some way that I could help people in a more of a guidance sort of way? Right, right. Um, and then I just kind of pushed it to the side. And then um, I had the opportunity in 2018 to enter a pitch competition for a business idea. And so I was voluntold to enter this pitch competition <laughs> because I mentioned an idea. You know how you're sitting around with your friends or your associates, you're like, oh, what if I could do this or what if that, that, that? And somebody could say, well, why don't you do it? And I'm like, no, no, not me. Why oh, wow. not me? That's why awesome. Me? Right. Because so it takes, you got to be yeah. brave. You got to be brave. Yeah. 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 So I entered the pitch competition and I won third place. It was the Fort Worth Startup Weekend. And that gave me the motivation to continue to move forward because it was so receptive by people. That's great. That's awesome. And when you, mm -hmm. you know, I want a lot of people really, you know, they, when we fail and I know I've gone through this where, oh, I'm just really hard on myself or, oh, I got to mm -hmm. start over. Even in my own patient advocacy business, I, you know, basically very recently did a, a big reset in the whole business because I, you know, so much information is coming at us with different apps and oh, how to do man. things, how to start, wh what you need to do. You know, you need this software, that software, you need to be on this social media, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I think it gets really overwhelming now often because yeah. there's so much being thrown it's, it's, at us. Yeah. And especially if you've never had a business. Right. Right. So, and I, yeah, and I, you know, never, I'm a, I'm a new yeah. entrepreneur coming into it. I have an MBA, which of course they don't really teach you anything about startups in your no. MBA program. <laughs> You know, so it's, you know, I've just learned through doing and what I found like anything like this podcast or learning how to video edit or any of it is just, uh -huh. just start doing it, you know, use what yeah. we do on the same hand, have so much at our fingertips available. And even if it was 10 or 20 years ago, you know, we always have people, we always have the ability to network and build yeah. relationships, which to me is still the foundation of everything. Right. Oh, my goodness. You're so right. And also, I would say to new entrepreneurs or people who are thinking about entrepreneurship, don't go in with the false expectation that everything's going to be lined up. Everything's going to be bam, bam, bam. And I'm going to make all this money and life is going to be grand. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. Don't do that. Nope. No. Nope. And don't, you know, I know I like, for example, I bought a, a pretty expensive piece of software last year. And then I realized I didn't really even, I wasn't even ready to use it. And, mm. and then that, you know, so just basically a waste mm -hmm. of money, honestly. And, oh, you know, but it's also but a learning learn. process, right? We learn. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. then subsequently a much less expensive, but just as robust piece of software has presented itself that I mean, it's a difference of like $3,000 a year to 200 for exactly the same type of software. But wow. um, and I'm like, 
you know, so, and I, I tell people, I go, it's not always like people get drawn to the, to the name or, oh, you got to have this name brand, this or that, or you got to have the road mic. You got to have the, the best of everything. No, not really. Like I'm going to mm-hmm. keep driving my Prius till it dies. You know, <laughs> it's, you got to, you got to think about, you know, how you're budgeting the long game, um, all oh, the expenses. Yes. I mean, people, you know, it's funny because I have so many people ask me, you know, on Facebook or friends, oh, how's the business going? And it's so hard to answer that question because, you know, people think you're going to start a business. I'm going to put up a sign. I'm going to start a website. And then the money's just going to roll in, whether I'm selling yep. a real product or a virtual product or a service. And that's just not the case. And every dollar you make as an entrepreneur, you're really only going to really net keep, when I say net, take home about 50 cents on that dollar. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's all about budgeting. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So the reality and, and people often, you know, I ask people, cause I help, I do help people do some kind of projections and I ask them, well, okay, so how much, what's your dream number of what you want to make gross and net? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now how many hours are you going to work or, you know, what's your product? What's your mm-hmm. cost? What's your price mm-hmm. point? You know, and then we do the math and, and I, the math never works out. The math is, <laughs> it never, it's some, I'm like, is yeah. there like five other people you're going to have working for you? Or are there, are you yeah. getting free labor somewhere? Like, how is this all going to work out? Or are you going to work 24 seven? You know, yeah. which, which you're going to do anyways, FYI, as an entrepreneur, you're going to be working around the clock. It's a Saturday here. Deidre's given her time. I, I'm using my time. You know, we work constantly. I'm on my mm-hmm. email two in the morning, whatever it is. We're trying to just keep up with all the things. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so, so you, you know, and I, and I, you know, that was the thing for me when you talk about there's got to be something more to provide for patients. Yeah. When I became a nurse, I was already had a lot of experience in healthcare. Um, uh, from my mom also, and and both my parents. So I had a comfort in healthcare, but I also knew there was a lot of deficits mm-hmm. that really there was this gap, you know, and then we're in the box. And I want to bring up something else for folks listening is, you know, we talk about get outside the box or break through the box, right? In healthcare, we have this box of uh, insurance, right? We think, oh, oh, if it doesn't occur with an insurance, then it's not possible, Right. Or we can't, or if it doesn't incur within some giant nonprofit, you know, American Heart Association, right. you know, one of these big, large organizations, um, then it's not possible. But that's not the case. And and so talk mm-hmm. about how you know you came into this and and decided I'm going to bust through the box and I'm going to I'm just not even going to play in the box anymore. Oh, that's such a great question. So. Um... I go back when I presented that pitch competition, that first ignited a fire in me. It made me believe in nursing once again. And then I had to sit back and say, okay, what are my services going to be? And it was basically where I was more comfortable finding those gaps. Uh, critical care. You come into the hospital, we send you home, we treat you, we treat you, we send you home, but mm-hmm. you still got all this legwork to do. So, um, And then when my mother, at the same time that I was kind of pivoting from the hospital to going maybe full time in uh, my my business, she became sick at the age of 52. And it looked like she had Parkinson's. It looked like she had MS. Mm. So some of those symptoms are the same, but those disease processes are treated totally different. Right, right. So I had to go back and re-educate myself on neurological disease processes because people think a nurse is a nurse is a nurse. Oh, gosh. We specialize. Right. So I don't know nothing about kids. I don't know nothing right. about babies. Right. I Me too. heart, lungs, and kidneys. <laughs> right. Yes, yes. And especially so, if you're, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know. I'm assuming you worked in a really large hospital in Texas. I mean, I know there's some big, Mm -hmm. big hospitals in Texas. And oftentimes when you work in a really large medical center, you really get niched in to your specialty. There's, there's multiple ICUs, multiple levels of units, Um, you know, so you kind of get a little more isolated away from, you know, if you're working cardiology, you're not really going to see the neuro stuff. You're not going to see, you know, you're not going to see babies and, you know, we were we were had our own building, <laughs> so right? Like that part of the hospital was like the cardiac tower, <laughs> right? So you didn't venture off the cardiac tower, but yes. uh, 
when she was going through that, trying to get off work and be at the doctor's visit with her was like pulling teeth from a grizzly bear. Mm. And I always had to explain to my supervisor what I was doing. And Adrian, that ticked me off. That doesn't make any, I mean, that's horrible. And a lot of people too, I I realized because I was a, a union rep. Bef- I worked for mm. a union before I became a nurse. Okay. I was a union organizer and, and I, and it was pretty much mostly healthcare. And then um, most people don't understand that they have FMLA benefits that are called mm-hmm. intermittent FMLA, where you yes. can take yeah. days off each month to care for yes. somebody else. You know, there's paperwork yes. that has to be done by the physician, or like say you have asthma or anxiety disorder, you yourself can take intermittent FMLA right. and have right. a few days off and your employer cannot do any, as long as you're eligible and qualify with your time that you've been on the job, um, you know, they can't do anything, but yeah, it's like, here we work. And here's another, you know, thing that people, I have heard this so many times people say, what what do you mean? You don't get free healthcare and you don't get everything free in a hospital. I'm like, no, it's not like pizza. It's not like a pizza place. (laughs) It's not a deli. I don't get a free sandwich. No, no, no. no. They charge you for parking as well. (laughs) Oh, and that too. Yeah. Then there's that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so so you were really feeling up against like your own yeah, schedule and the up needs of your mom the wall because you know I would have to go to my supervisor and say, well, I need to go to the doctor's visit with my mom next Wednesday, and they would, well, then she already go to the doctor last week, so it's oh. like, oh my yeah. goodness. So with that being <laughs> said, I thought about lay people. Yeah, what are they doing when they can't get out to work and mom or dad goes to the doctor and. You know, they don't know the questions to ask or or anything like that. So I was like, okay, what if I could, as a nurse, I could do that with people, actually walk them with them. Right. And give them the guidance and the needs. And so that's how I came up with a lot of my services, seeing the gaps of what people need when Mm -hmm. they're trying to navigate healthcare. Right. I mean, even for somebody who is physically able, mentally able, Mm -hmm. things are so stressful when you get a really life changing diagnosis. um, You know, we have something called the reticular activation system in the body, right? We have the vagal response. We have the panic, you know, Mm -hmm. fight or flight. Everything Mm -hmm. goes out the window. You stop listening. You stop hearing. You stop thinking. Your stress levels off the roof. You, you know, you're if when you're up against your own life with a diagnosis or a significant change in life, mm-hmm. um, you need somebody by your side who's objective and not emotionally involved. And that's Absolutely. what nurses, specifically what nurses, we're, we're already trained to do that. We're trained. Yes. So, so you, you yes. move forward and you think, here's, an, here's, a, here's a niche, here's, an, here's a problem that needs to be solved. And this Absolutely. is the, how businesses are created. A problem that needs to be solved by enough people uh-huh. in an area you can reach, you know, in a manner you can reach people and, and do and execute oh, absolutely. that solution. When you know you are trying to solve a problem, you stop chasing the money. Right. The money is right. going to come. Right. Right. It's the problem. So that's why I feel like this is my purpose in life is to help people understand their their plan of care, help people Mm -hmm. know what's going to be expected so we can make plans today for six months, nine months, one year down the line. And then they're not so stressed out when a crisis occurs. Right. And also starting this company. So when I started the company and I had my services, well, guess what happened? 2020. Right there, then you have it. <laughs> so then I had to pivot again, right? Because I was not going to go back into the hospital. I'm sorry, yeah. I was going to continue to do this business, and so I drew back a little bit and I started pouring into myself for the vision of the business. I got my BCPA, I got my board certified patient advocate. I got my certified case manager in addition to my legal nurse consultant, you know, so just different right. things and trying to see, okay, where do I want the company's vision of your healthcare nurse advocates to go? Right. Education, advocate, yeah. ad- advocacy, and navigation. So sometimes I introduce myself as educator, navigator, and advocator. 
for people and family. So my goal is to make sure that you have that knowledge in a way you can understand. And then we make a plan on what next. We got to break down this big puzzle and we're going to mm-hmm. build the frame first by getting you access to resources or helping you have learn how to have a voice mm-hmm. in your healthcare journey. Absolutely. And do you still, are you still accompanying people virtually or live to doctor's appointments? Yes, so I do that as well. Uh, we provide resources, uh, accompany my clients to their doctor's visits, procedures. We also, some of my clients like a weekly in-home visit just to make sure all the ducks are in a row. Are you satisfied with your home health company? Are you satisfied with your personal care company? Are you satisfied with rehab or whatever is going on in their journey so that's how we help right. them navigate through the maze of resources because sometimes they don't even know some of these resources exist right so or they don't know that they can okay. they don't know they can switch they don't know you know because you know, know i I, I know like for example i crushed my leg in a horrible accident in my late 20s oh. and um the doctor the surgeon um you know, he one left a screw in my leg, never told me uh, that broke off. Mm-hmm. And but he referred me to mm-hmm. what ended up being his own physical therapy um, mm-hmm. provider in his own building. And it was a really when I say run down kind of just, you know, schlocky mm-hmm. kind of place. I, I and I was, you know, an athlete and, and very active at that point in my life. And I thought, you know, I don't I don't have to do this. So I <laughs> I started calling around and mm-hmm. I found a physical therapy place in my town that was run by the trainers for the Olympic water polo team oh, that were wow. really athlete focused. They were, you know, they were like, Hey, we want to get you above and beyond. I moved over there with a, with a quickness. And, mm-hmm. you know, my doctor tried to even tell me you can't change. I mean, even using those words and again, and I wasn't a nurse at this point. Um, and I uh-huh. said, yeah, I great. Thank you for being my surgeon. I understand I can't change surgeons, you know, cause that's a whole other topic about changing surgeons. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nobody wants to touch you after you've been touched by one surgeon. Um, exactly. and, but I said, but I'm for sure moving over here. And and it was, I mean, because this is a, you're looking at something the rest of your life. You're looking at this is the care you're going to get that's going to make a difference yeah. of your functionality, your health, yeah. your disease process. Yeah. Is this the right, you know, kind of treatment if it's a cancer issue? Is it, you know, and it's always, always get that second and third opinion, you know, always yeah. ask around. But yeah, resources yeah. are, we're kind of like private case managers Absolutely. in a way. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I and it's so funny because that's another podcast. <laughs> Working <laughs> with the case managers in the hospitals and the rehabs and things like that. They don't understand that we are there to help enhance the client's journey, not take over or try to tell right. them how to do their job, or there's ways we can collaborate. Um, That's a perfect segue yeah. because I was just going to ask, because I'm always curious when I speak with my colleagues, how are you received by the providers, the, you know, all the parties in healthcare when, because a lot of people don't know one, what we do. So it's not a yeah. common, you know, uh, type of role that people immediately right. know, oh, okay, this is what this person does. So there's some explaining that goes on. And then, mm-hmm. you know, I, so I'm always curious whether it's received well, collaboratively or adversarially. <laughs> um, I would say 80% adversarially until they start to learn what it is that we do. So it's mm-hmm. also educating the public and the other healthcare providers that we work with um, also. Because gotcha. it can be a little standoffish, I mean, but we've seen it in healthcare all along. Healthcare is such a bullying system. Let's oh, keep that yes. real. Yep. Um, you have one physician or nurse come in and say, well, why did those so-and-so do that? So mm-hmm. it's, it's always like a wall that's put up, you know, when my personal experience with the business, it's a wall that's put up. So I have to give them grace mm-hmm. um, because they don't really understand. So let me just be the model of what we do as outside advocates and how we can work with you as a inpatient or in-house advocate. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. I think that what doctors and providers um, may not realize is that by us being involved with their patients, we're going mm -hmm. to increase compliance, education, Mm -hmm. follow up, 
adherence right. to treatment plans. Now we may it's also be questioning stress. things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's, there's yeah. a lot more yeah. for the doctors to gain uh, providers to gain in this by having, you know, us being involved. And it's very clear just so everybody listening that it, it doesn't understand patient advocacy. You know, we are there hundred percent for our clients. That's the, that's our, that's our team. We're team client. We're not team anybody yeah. else, but team client right. and or family, yeah. whatever, whoever's hired us. And some of us do mm -hmm. for me, I do like a whole family kind of as a client mm -hmm. um, system. Mm -hmm. And so it's, but it's really important to uh, explain it. And then sometimes what I tell the product doctors, especially not really NPs get it. PAs kind of get it. I would say, well, it's kind of like concierge medicine. Yeah. So just think of it like that. And then they, they kind yeah. of clicks and then they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's not like concierge medicine where you go and place your order. <laughs> right, right. It's all right. about assessing where you are and you setting goals as a patient and family. So I call that kind of building your medical village. You know, what do you want? What are your goals? Because the doctors all have, you can have a cardiologist, a pulmonologist, a renal doctor, and your PCP, and they all probably have a different goal. Absolutely. So advocate can help you get them all on the same page with putting you at the center of care. Yes. Because people don't know that, you know, if you got more than one physician, they probably don't have the time to talk to each other because they are yeah. overwhelmed. There's, themselves. I would say 99% of the time, unless mm -hmm. you're in a system, I only was in one healthcare system in my life where I really validated that the doctors were, mm -hmm. were talking to each other to solve the problem right. of what was going on with my immune system, which they never did mm -hmm. solve, which, you know, is, is okay with some freaky thing, but the collaboration was there. So unless you're in a system that yeah. is set up like that, where it's a research mm -hmm. hospital and, you know, kind of facility where that's just part of the culture. Right. But yes. when you're dealing with yes. Because the thing with doctors, right, providers are like lawyers. If they're not getting paid, they don't want to do it. And then they don't also have the time, especially if they're rounding in a hospital and then they're seeing patients in their clinics. Um, yes. You know, th this is a, they're working 24 seven. And so, you know, I want to have empathy for them also. And the system's not built up for them. Mm -hmm. And off, also doctors don't know how to bill sometimes. So that's something mm -hmm. that I help them with too, is that, hey, you, are you billing for complex visits? Are you getting that extra money? Are you doing chronic care management? Are you know? Are you you know? Are you deploying all the things that you have with your billing and coding? Because again, they're more or less you know dealing with insurance for reimbursements versus oh, yes. us, where we're cash. Yeah. We're all 100% cash pay for the most part. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Because insurance so, doesn't really know how to navigate independent advocates because <laughs> yeah. we're all different. <laughs> yeah. And I think, and so just to be clear to folks, some of us are nurses. Now, when I became an a advocate, and I think it was 2018 or 19, um, I just assumed everybody would be an RN. It didn't even occur to me that somebody would do this mm -hmm. and not be an RN. Uh, but then I discovered actually, and I don't know what the breakdown is, but many people I've come in contact with are not, I'd say the mm -hmm. majority even, or at least half. Now there's, I'm meeting yeah. some pharmacists that are entering the space, which is yes. great. Yes. Um, yes. But you know, if there's, there's something, if you're really dealing with a clinical issue, um, not a medical insurance issue, if you're dealing with an mm -hmm. insurance issue, there's definitely some patient advocates out there that really specialize in that. Now, if you yes. want clinical, I just think we bring to the table something very unique because we yes. understand the language. You know, you and I can go look at a patient. We can hear that. We can listen to them breathe. We can look at them. We can have them tell us two medications they're on and we already know what's yes. going on. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we yep. do. Yep. And I'm so glad you mentioned that because that led into another pivot in the business where uh, I was working the business and working with my clients and then patient portals. Oh, yes. They're not all created equal. And even myself as a nurse has some difficulty navigating some of these patient portals. Yes. Um, yes. It's finding out where to go so you can, you know, why use your time wisely. And then even when you have a patient portal, even if you do have your physicians on that patient portal, don't sit back and say, oh, okay, they're talking to each other. Mm -mm. Not unless it's five minutes before your meeting, your mm -hmm. next visit, or 
Uh, what if you have a standalone provider that has their own patient portal? They're not talking to the hospital system. So right. what I found is that lots of times people would go to one doctor, let's say it's your renal doctor, and they expect the renal doctor to let the cardiologist and the pulmonologist and everybody else know what was done. That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. Mm -mm. So I created a medical binder for my clients. And Fabulous. in their medical binder, they have everything that pertains to their healthcare journey, whether it's their last visit, their last labs, their last procedures, their uh, healthcare power of attorney, their advanced directives, their insurance bills, whatever is in there. And so we incorporated that. And I started using it and I started talking to other advocates. They're like, oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there are many, many, many uh, online systems for navigation that you can go and upload your mm -hmm. information and put it in there. But at the same token, what if you're 65, mm -hmm. you have congestive heart failure, COPD, mm -hmm. hypertension, and you're in pain, and you want to go to the patient portal and try to navigate that? No. So why not build a medical binder? So what we started doing uh, this year, we've incorporated another advanced service on education. So we created Fabulous. a healthcare academy for lay people. Now, healthcare providers can attend as well because sometimes healthcare providers, guess what? We have issues medically. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so that's sometimes what we're doing. we need. We're sometimes we need the reminders. Academy. Sometimes we, you know, oh. like, like you said, you don't do peds or, or babies. I don't either, no. you know, and I don't <laughs> really know much about oncology either. That's just not my wheelhouse, um, you know, coming off the units that I came off of. And yeah, so right. it's, and I think that the great thing right now, I want to just say to anybody listening, who's thinking about getting into this space of becoming a patient advocate, pivoting, or is wanting the services of a patient advocate, um, this is, we're, we're kind of the pioneers. We are the pioneers. This is like the first second. We're still living in the first second of the hour yeah. uh -huh. of patient You're advocacy. Right. I right. mean, people, I, I, cause I've heard some people, you know, react about insurance, maybe getting in this game or, um, or, you know, competition. And, and I want to say, if you're an entrepreneur, don't have a scarcity mindset, have an abundance mindset, because even if, Dieter and I are selling the same product, right? We're in mm -hmm. different markets. There's yeah. a whole globe. You're not even, we're not limited to even the United States because healthcare, whether you're in a country that is got nationalized health insurance, the level of education is still the same. People have no clue what's going on. Oh, yes. And I want to say something about that too. So you are so right. So we are in on like the first or the second generation <laughs> of mm -hmm. independent advocates. But I have another friend, nurse advocate. She lives, or her business is like 90 minutes away from me. So uh -huh. we collaborate a lot together because think of it like this. It is no scarcity. It's an abundance of people who need your services. So how many people can you by yourself adequately serve? Right, right. Not more. So you have to come up with that golden number. And at different yourself. price points too. There's different yeah. price points. I mean- my yeah. services for me, I would rather have a few clients that are yep. paying a high level, right? Or they're getting a high level right. concierge service than right. run myself thin. And based on that right. kind of model, it's going to take me a little bit longer to build yeah. that, which is fine. Right. Now, I'm also thinking, well, how do I help people at a different economic level than the 1%, right? Because right. let's face it, we we're less than a lawyer but we're, we're, we cost, right? People charge anywhere from $125 an hour, hundred dollars an hour up for their services because it's our time. And because remember, we're only going to net about 50% of that after we pay taxes, overhead and everything. Oh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> if even that, it might be 40% is what we might get 40 cents on the dollar. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, like I charge, I do, uh, uh, you know, people can buy a package basically of hours. Cause I know there's going to be a lot yeah. of back end stuff, but making mm -hmm. it accessible to mm -hmm. the average person who makes $25 an hour, right. Yeah. Um, who is like the working class or, you know, if it's yeah. a family and I always say to people, if you've got a family of five or six members of adults, working people, and you've got one person and mom's sick or dad's mm -hmm. sick, 
There's mm -hmm. actually no reason why you can't pull your money and, and have a get a few hours of a patient advocate. And I encourage people to oh, do that. Oh, you are so right, Adrian. And that's another reason why, you know, because we're private pay. Mm -hmm. um, and I charge an hourly rate for my services. But that's why I thought about the Healthcare Academy. Yes. So I budgeted that. I priced that at, at where those who can't afford the hourly rate of an advocate, it's more like a DIY program to learn how right. to be your own advocate. Right. So that's what that one's about. And then also I tell people there's many of us advocates, like you were saying earlier, there's advocates who navigate insurance. There's advocates who navigate medical billing. Now, I don't do it all. So I like to subcontract with other advocates that have an mm -hmm. expertise in an area I don't have. Absolutely. And people are spending a lot of money on services for in, like medical and that medical insurance side. I'm just shocked what I've been learning about it, that people, you know, are paying $60,000, $50,000, $10,000 up front because they don't understand their health insurance or somebody's telling them they have to pay this and they don't understand they can negotiate it. You know, wow. everything is negotiable. You know, mm -hmm. I'm negotiable. Everything is negotiable, right? Yeah. So it's always worth mm -hmm. it to ask and really push it yeah. and drive it. Um, yeah. You know, the only thing that even, you know, um, so I just want to leave people with that, you know, about the medical insurance component. I think that that those folks that do that are very specialized. You know, I, I've added a little bit of it to my service line, but most mm -hmm. of it is contracted out, you know, but again, that takes mm -hmm. collaboration and relationships. And, yeah. you know, just like if somebody wants a pharmacy review more in depth, great. I'll hook them up with a pharmacist uh, patient advocate, or if they want a chart review, I have NPs and doctors of the various mm -hmm. specialties who can do mm -hmm. a full chart review for somebody because that's not in my scope of practice. We don't give medical right. advice. I want to make that very clear to everybody. You know, I mm -hmm. may say to a patient, well, hey, did the did, did they order this test? Did they order this exam? Did they mm -hmm. rule out this disease? Because for folks, right. again, if you're not in healthcare, the way you get diagnosed for a disease um, is called differential mm -hmm. diagnosis, which means you're ruling out all the things it's not. We only know you're orange because you're not blue, yeah. you're not green, you're not purple. Okay. If mm -hmm. that makes sense. So we test for a lot of things to rule things out and then narrow it in. But then there's also these insurance algorithms. So like for back pain, right? You get put in a back pain algorithm. Now the doctor's really limited on what they can order, right? Oh, we get some NSAIDs, yeah. some, we get some physical therapy. And then three months later, yeah. six months later, we can yeah. do this or that. Well, you may end up having a you know, metastasized tumor. And that's causing your back pain. And that now is much worse. So this is, again, where a patient advocate, if things are not making sense to you as a patient, reach out to a patient advocate, reach out to Deidre, right. my, you know, if, myself. You can go on the Greater National Advocates website and, and there's right. tons of advocates right. listed. Um, but this is very important is that do not... And it's not that the doctor's lying. It's not that the provider's not good. They're not, they're not doing their job. It's that everybody is stretched to the max in healthcare. Yeah. Everybody yeah. is stretched to the max in healthcare and really bound by these insurance companies. And as we just recently saw with, um, with, uh, I can't remember the, the company that just, uh, what they do 350,000 rejections through their artificial intelligence, um, just did blanket rejections of appeals yet doctors, mm -hmm. a doctor had to sign off on all of those. So I, there's going to be some, fa there's fallout from that. Right. So, um, yeah. definitely, you know, find a patient advocate depending on your issue, but I love this patient Academy. I love this binder idea. How do people reach you and get a hold of you to, uh, talk to you about services or find out what might fit their budget or their needs? Wonderful. So they can either go to my website and schedule a free 30 minute uh, phone consultation. The website is Your Healthcare Nurse Advocates, just like the title, dot com. Or you can call me at 817-854-3240 and call and schedule a free 30-minute phone consultation to see if our needs or our programs fit your needs. Oh, that's great. And then what, um, now you're also on LinkedIn. Is that a place for people? Yes, I'm also, yes, I think I'm on everything. <laughs> Is that a good place uh, for people LinkedIn, to professionally? Facebook. Yes, I have a professional LinkedIn page. I had a podcast, but I am not really able to actively record anymore, but they're yeah. out there. 
it's, um, it's so hard to do all the things, Facebook, right? Yes, Instagram. Um, the podcast was Health Chats Among Friends, where I brought other industry professionals on to educate about services that are available. And um, I'd love to hear from you. Just go to my website and book a calendarly 30-minute um, free phone consultation. That's awesome. That's awesome. I just I had to close the window and I'm looking. I'm trying to pull it up really quick here. So uh, so how so tell me on the academy. Let's talk really quickly before we close. How does that work? Is it on demand? Is it live sessions? Is it multiple sessions? How how is this working? So right now the sessions can be booked. So what we're we're gearing toward is buying the session in a series package, either per person or for a family or for a corporation. We will book uh, events where we come to you virtually or in person. Um, we will guide you through number one. The first session is building your medical binder. Session number two is making sense of my medication. And session three is knowing my labs and my numbers. All those are the foundation for you to be effective and have a voice during your doctor's visit or your entire medical journey. Gotcha. Okay. So, so how many, so how many sessions is it then? It's right just, now it's three and growing. <laughs> three and growing. Okay. So three and growing. We, okay. we have, yes, ma'am. So we have launched the series. You can find that on the website too. Just go to your healthcare nurse advocates.com and look up there and hit the key for healthcare Academy. And let and, me, and I'm um, pulling it up. So if you're on, if you're yeah. watching this, I'm going to pull this up. It's on the website here and I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So we can see. So the all bundle class. Okay, this is great. Three workshops, how to build a new medical binder, make sense of my medications, making sense of labs and numbers, right? Boy, this is so important. I just love this. And then you're also available for speaking engagements. Love yes, it. Yes, I am. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. People need to, people need this information, right? People, this is so important, the pivot that you made to do this, because, you know, what we're doing out here is we're saving lives and we're extending people's quality of their lives, right? Um, I mean, things like making sense of my medications, how to an effective and efficient doctor's visit, right? Um, building your medical village. I love, I love this page, by the way. I had not seen this. <laughs> Thank um, you. This is great. I just love this. And, you know, again, this is about the networking. So if you are an organization that wants to um, have, you know, maybe you're the Kiwanis Club. I don't know. Some, you know, a lot yeah. of different organizations. So maybe you churches. want to retain your employee retention. They've, they've been calling in sick or trying to get off to go to the doctor's visit with their mom. Right. And, and we all know. I mean, I recently had a, a medical issue. I, you know, dislocated mm -hmm. my knee and yeah. um you know, it's like every time anything comes up that's not routine, um, it's hours. It's not like minutes. It's not like a quick phone call. It's you're on hold, you know, for 30 minutes, 40 minutes longer than your lunchtime. You know, you got a call during a certain time. You got to, you know, there's a lot of things that go on into getting health care or I mean, I, I know I think I spent four hours once just trying to find which urgent care was covered into my insurance at one point. Oh, and, you know, I thought, well, okay, great. I have the, you know, I have the time, but not everybody does. So, you know, this is so important. So I thank you so much. And, and I want to um, make sure folks find you um, no matter where you're at. And again, our services are available to people who are expats also. So somebody who's maybe an expat, not even living in this country or somebody who's, you know, lives in another country, the healthcare Academy is a great resource, right? Everybody, yeah. everyone yeah. needs this. Um, what is the number? 10,000 people are turning 65 every day in the United every States. Day. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 20% and of us, including me are going to be, what are they, what do they call us? Aging alone, ager, aging alone. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, solo. Solo yeah. agers. Yes, There's like an acronym yeah, for it. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I can't remember. <laughs> right. But so yeah. 20%. I mean, this is a huge number. So, and again, you know, when you need a healthcare advocate, a patient navigator, somebody clinical with clinical expertise, like, like Dieter or myself or others, you know, you could be somebody who is an executive in Dubai and your mom is in Wisconsin. You know, oh you could goodness. be across the yes. country. You, what we do is also we sell people back their time. We sell you back your peace of mind because we do all that work. And then we just report to you and say, here's what's going on. Here's some decisions that you can make. Um, I want to you know, make sure I emphasize that 
part of what we do is clinical decision support. We help people make decisions oh. and in an educated way because you're thrown into decision making often right on the spot in a doctor's office. Well, do you want to have yeah. this chemotherapy? We're booking you for this, or the you know, provider comes in, we're booking you for this appointment and you're going to yeah. start chemo tomorrow, or you're going to start, you know, we're doing angioplasty yeah. at 2 PM, you know, and yeah. people are just overwhelmed. It's overwhelming. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Adrian, it's, it's amazing to have the water hose. I call that, that's what I call a water hose of information. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you can make an adequate educated decision in that type of environment. No, it's so hard. It's so it's yeah under stress. So it's really important to, for our services, we let people know what to expect because oftentimes doctors may sugarcoat things too, or they may not be realistic. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, we're a nurse, we're going to go, mm, yeah, we know exactly what CHF is going to, where that road's going to go. <laughs> like there's only yeah. one way that yeah. road's going at this, with what yeah. we have now, right? Or renal failure or diabetes yes. uh, with somebody who's non-compliant. We, we already know, we already see what's coming down the pike, right? Um, so right. if you're listening to this, watching this on YouTube, make sure that you please subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to the podcast, follow, like, wherever you're listening to this, whether it's on Spotify or Apple, um, make sure that you're sharing this and please share Deidre's information, reach out to her, get on top of this academy, um, this opportunity, because I know that this is just going to blow up and be a much bigger uh, piece of your business. Um, this is, you know, a, a great, great idea. And and the binder, so do you mail the binder? I just am curious. So do you actually physically yeah, mail? Yes, so we have, uh, we, I tried to think of everything I possibly could. So if they want the, mail, the binder shipped to them, we do that at a cost. Um, and uh, cost would include the shipping or if they're on site and they want to buy a binder. But the best way is to, you know, get a binder, go through the academy. And I'm even reaching out to other patient advocates who want to start teaching the binder class along with me. Fabulous. Uh, I'll bring all the material. You can brand the binder worksheets if you like. And we go through all that process because I want to help advocates grow their business so we can reach those that are underserved or they can't afford an uh, advocate. So that's yeah. another way that you can that's expand beautiful. your business. Yeah. I mean, if you get into retirement community, right? Like I'm going to the Poconos oh, in a couple yeah. weeks to see a friend, oh, right? Yeah. And who's staying with her, with her family in some, you know, mm -hmm. over 55 community. And, yeah. you know, and I'm like, these retirement communities, I mean, you could sell 50 of these in one time, right? I mean, you just, yeah. it's, and yeah. a lot of it's word of mouth and recommendations. So yeah. fabulous. Yeah. It's been such a pleasure speaking yeah. with you and hearing your story. Yeah. And, and I think we're going to have a couple more podcasts together. I think we've got some other topics we're going to be it discussing. Sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys, thank you so much. And make sure you follow, subscribe, comment, um, check out uh, Deidre's page and your healthcare nurse advocates. Uh, whether you, she's also got a Facebook page, she's on LinkedIn, yeah. um, contact her, check out, you know, all of her pages on her website, click through it and, and share that information. And if you know somebody who's in need, who could really use the services of the Academy, please, please refer them uh, to her website. Thank you so much. And um, we'll yeah. talk, we're going to talk again soon. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Appreciate you. Thank you.